Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 if you haven't already. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. The title of the message this morning is No Divisions Among You. No Divisions Among You. Obviously that comes from the memory verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Uh, no Divisions Among You. So, you know, we've moved on from Psalms for now. Uh, once we've done 1 Corinthians, we'll get back to Psalms and we'll do a bit more of that and then we'll get to our next book and so on and so forth. But the reason I wanted to start with the book of 1 Corinthians as our first major book that we, 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 we go through on Sunday is that, in my opinion anyway, I, I think it's pretty correct, is that the Corinthian church is by far the worst church that we read about in the New Testament. All right? The worst church. I mean, they had some major problems. They had some major issues. They had divisions among them. All right? they, were, they were messed up on doctrine. They had great sin in the church. And if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, it's just Paul's just constantly correcting them over everything, basically. He calls them carnal. He calls them babies. Right? He calls them babes in Christ. You know, and I just wanted to look, hey, this is a bad church, but it's still a church of God. It's still a church of Christ, okay? Now, maybe you've been to a bad church. Maybe you can look at some churches that you've been to in the past. You know, you say, well, Kevin, I mean, that was a pretty bad... I mean, they weren't even soul winning, you know. I mean, I don't even know. Like, you know, the doctrine that they were preaching was watered down. Hey, but if they were at least believe in the gospel, if they were at least believe in the right doctrine on the gospel and salvation, they are a church of God. And God is concerned about those churches, all right? It's not good for us to just bag out other churches, you know, ones that we haven't fit in in the past or whatever. It's not good to bag out this church, right? But we see that Paul comes in with corrective measures, with corrective action to get this church back on the map, to get this church back being effective, being the united church, being right on doctrine. And I look at this church and I don't never want to become what the Corinthian church was when Paul wrote this first letter. Okay, so that way we can look at it, learn from the mistakes, and that way when, if we see our church going down a bad path like that, we go, oh, hold on, Kevin, remember 1 Corinthians. We don't want to be like that church, right? Now, what I want to say to you is this. It did not start out as a bad church. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians and turn to Acts 18. Acts 18, because I just want to show you the beginnings of this church in Acts chapter 18. Okay, Acts chapter 18, you guys know, Acts t talks a lot about the missionary journey of Paul, all right? And he went from city to city establishing churches, city to city preaching the gospel, getting souls saved. And we pick up the story from in Acts 18 when he first came to Corinth, Acts chapter 18. Now, let me warn you, I've got about eight pages of notes on this chapter. I don't think I'm going to cover it all. In fact, I know I'm not going to be able to cover it all. So some of this stuff is going to spill over on Thursday, okay? So I'll just be mindful as to what I'm going to let, let spill over. But uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. Let's, let's start reading from there. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came into Corinth. Okay, that's the Corinthians church, right? They came into Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So Aquila and uh, Priscilla, his wife, they had departed out of Rome. They were Jews. For some reason, this Claudius had, a, had commanded all Jews to get out of Rome. So they come to Corinth, and that's where Paul meets this couple. Okay? Um, and let me just say, Aquila and Priscilla are praised in the Bible as being great workers with Paul. Okay? These, this was a great couple. If, if you want to know how to be a great husband and wife team working for the Lord, study Aquila and Priscilla. Okay? Now, just to show you this very quickly, is that Paul came to these believers, just proving to you that Paul was not a one-man one show. Yes, Paul was a great man of God. He did many things, but he always had helpers with him. He always had people together with him, helping him and working in the gospel. Okay? He gets a lot of praise. Paul gets a lot of that attention, but he had other people around him. And when Paul goes into, well, Paul is in eternity, but when Paul receives his rewards, it's not going to be him alone, but those that helped him along his journey. Look at verse 3. And because he was of the same craft, or we might say because, because he was of, of the same trade, right? 
He abode with them and wrought for their occupation for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Paul was a tent maker. That's how he made his living going preaching the gospel to uh, the gospel to the cities that was he was at. But so was Aquila and Priscilla. They were they were all tent makers. That was their craft. That was their trade. They were able to get together. He was able to stay with them, but also to work together and have an income so that way they could provide for themselves as they went preaching the gospel. And look at verse number four. And he reasoned, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So we can say it this way. Paul went into the city of Corinth and in those days the, the synagogue was like the church. It wasn't the church, but it was like the church. That's where people came together, read the scriptures together, talked about the scriptures, and Paul went there every Sabbath uh, teaching people, right? But what I find interesting here is in verse number 5, and when Silas and Timotheus, these are other helpers that came to Paul to help him in the work in Corinth, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, and testify to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. What I want to take away from that is, even though Paul was teaching people in the, in the, in the synagogue, it seemed like, at that point in time, he was not teaching them that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. He was teaching them things out of the old, you know, out of the scriptures, but was not pointing them to Christ until Silas and Timotheus came from Macedonia. Okay? Now, it's somehow that pressed him in the spirit and he taught them, the Jews, that Jesus was Christ. He was more bold when he had those helpers come with him. He was more bold when he knew he had Silas and Timotheus with him as well as Aquila and Priscilla. And let me tell you now that I will be more bold as a preacher if I have the people in this church backing me up with what I'm preaching, right? Backing me up as long as it's from the scriptures. Obviously, I will be more bold to preach from the Bible. And sometimes we wonder why these preachers in some other churches are so lame and so watered down. You know, maybe, yeah, you know, they're the leader. They ought to be leading the way. But many times their church congregation are not supporting the preacher. Many times they're in the church congregation saying, hey, pastor, tone it down a little bit. You know, it's too, it's too rough. It's too aggressive. It's too, you know, um, confrontational. You know, tone it down a little bit for the rest of us. And you know what? The preacher needs support from other people. Okay, and I need your support, right? If you believe I'm preaching something from the Bible, say amen. I'd love to hear that. You know, some of you sometimes say that. And, you know, sometimes, Kevin, hey, you know, that's a tough topic. You got my back in. Preach it boldly. Preach it hard, brother, because it's the truth of God's word. Guess what? That will encourage me. Okay, but I also recognize that Paul, as an apostle, he was the leader, he was the example. He led the way, but we can see how he was influenced by having good godly men around him to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. Look at verse number 6. And when they opposed themselves, so when the Jews opposed themselves, they heard that Jesus was Christ and they rejected that. Those that reject the gospel oppose themselves. They're their own worst enemies when they reject the gospel. They oppose themselves and blasphemed. So I'm assuming they would have blasphemed the name of Christ. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, and henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. I will go unto the Gentiles. And what this reminds me of is, you know, when we go soul winning, when we go knock doors, when we preach the gospel and people reject the gospel, right? Sometimes it's, it's easy, especially when you, when you start out as a soul winner, it's easy to get offended when people reject the gospel because you feel like people are rejecting you. But really, they're rejecting Christ. Just as these Jews were rejecting Christ, blaspheming in the name of Christ. And you know what? If people aren't interested, you knock on the door, they're not interested to hear the gospel, you, like Paul, can say, your blood is upon your heads, I am clean. Right? God's not going to hold you accountable for that person's you know, damnation to hell if, should they continue rejecting the gospel. You are clean. You've done what you can. It's time to move on to the next house. That's what Paul did. He's moving on to the Gentiles now, right? He's moving on to the Gentiles. The city of Corinth was obviously made up of Jews, made up of uh, Gentiles as well. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 4 says this, For they are impudent children and stiff-necked, speaking about the nation, the Old Testament nation of Israel, 
I do send thee unto them. So God's telling Ezekiel, I send you unto this stiff-necked people, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And that's our message. When we go preach the gospel, we're telling them, Thus saith the Lord God. We're preaching from the word of God. And they, whether they hear or whether they will forbear, that's like reject and not want to hear what you're saying, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. Okay, so the purpose of you going soul winning, you might not get anyone saved, you might not even be able to get through the whole gospel presentation, that can be discouraging, but the Lord wants you to do that, so they, wait, they will know on the day of judgment that there was a prophet among them. That's how God sees you, preaching the gospel as a prophet, proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming the truth of God's word. Acts 18 verse 7. And he departed thence, so Paul departs away from the Jews. But this is, this is, I find this funny. He departs out of the synagogue, right, because they reject the gospel, and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. His house joined hard to the synagogue. So Paul says, all right, I'm done with you, walks next door and moves in there, to, with, in the house of Justice. In fact, his house was fixed hard. I'm assuming that means the same wall of the synagogue was, was part of the wall of Justice's house. So he's right there next door. He's preaching the gospel next door, right next door. It's, it's funny how God arranges things uh, like that. Now, uh, verse 8, And Crispus, now this, this is interesting. So the, the Jews in the synagogue have rejected Christ, right? Sometimes you might think they're rejecting the gospel, you know, but look at well, look what happens in verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians herein believed and were baptized. So sometimes you might think, man, that was a waste of time. But then the chief house, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on Christ, right? Sometimes it's the person you think least will receive the gospel that actually gets saved. I don't know if you've done this. You've gone, you've preached the gospel. You know, uh, this has happened many times. You knock on some guy's door. You know, he's shirtless. He's got tattoos all over his body. He looks pretty big. He looks pretty wild. And you're like, man, this guy's just going to reject me out. Like, you know, I'm, I'm almost afraid to talk to this guy. And then you find out, you start giving, and he, re, he accepts it. He, re, you know, he receives the word of God. You can never, you can't, you know, what's that saying? Uh, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? That's the same with soul winning. Sometimes I knock on the door, there's a nice lady, friendly, receives you, and you think, wow, this person's going to receive the gospel. You, you take out the Bible, oh, I'm not interested, and they reject you. They can be more harsh. The nice little lady can be a lot more harsh than the rough-looking dude, you know, with the rock music playing in the background. You know, I've gotten people saved where he just had his rock music blast, and I'm like, I, I can't even hear what I'm saying. I can't even hear my own thoughts. And the guy, you know, surely enough, got and saved. And so, you know, I don't know if Paul expected, you know, the Jews had rejected Christ. I don't know what he was expecting. The chief ruler of the synagogue would believe. And obviously, by his example, his whole house believed, his whole family, and then many other people in Corinth believed on Jesus Christ. So it's not a waste of time, okay? It's not a waste of time. Look at verse 9, Acts 18, verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. And I love this about the Lord. Not only does he send Paul workers and helpers, okay, he's probably discouraged that the Jews had been rejecting Christ, but then the Lord speaks to Paul in, in, in night by a vision. And look, the Lord's not going to speak to you in a vision. Okay? We have the whole Word of God available to you right now. If you want the Lord to speak to you at night, just open, wake up at night and open, open the Word of God. Have a read of God's Word. He will encourage you. But what does it say to Paul? Be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace. So this tells me that Paul must have been afraid. He must have been afraid that the Jews were rejecting him, they were blaspheming the name of Christ. The, the Lord comes, look, don't be afraid. Speak and hold not thy peace. And that's what I want to be as a preacher. I want to be able to speak and not hold my peace for fear of offending man. I want to be able to please the Lord, preach his word, and not be afraid. And I take to heart these words of God. You can take heart these words that he said to Paul. Be not afraid. Speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. The Lord is with us. I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Much people in this city. So God had other people in the city. 
other Christians in the city that were supporting Paul. Paul wasn't aware of this. He thought he had Aquila, Priscilla, you know, uh, Timotheus, and who was the other guy? Was it Silas? Can't remember what I... Huh? Silas, yeah, Silas, Justus, the place he's saying. You know, in a, in a big city, that's not many, but the Lord says, look, there are other Christians, there are other that are my people here. So don't be afraid. Preach. And this just reminds me, you know what? We need to support our saved Christian brothers. They might be a little different to us. They might believe a little bit differently. The style of church might be a little different to us. But if they're saved brothers of Christ, we ought to be able to support them. We ought to be able to encourage them. Because the Lord said to Paul, there are other people, there are other people, there are other um, saved Christians in the city that will support you, Paul. Just go out and preach. And I want to be like that. I want to be like a church that if there's other believers out there, other churches that are preaching the gospel, that we would be a help, that we would be a blessing, that we would be an encouragement to these people, an encouragement to our brothers in Christ, so they, cannot be, so they will not be afraid, and they can speak boldly and not hold their peace. God's people should encourage and support the preachers, support the pastors, support the bishops, support the guys going out soul winning, pray for them, encourage them. Okay. That's the beginning of the Corinthian church. Okay, we see many people getting saved. Now, if you can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I thought that was important as an introduction to the Corinthian church because we see people getting saved. It starts off super well. Okay, and Paul, did I read, verse, sorry, I'll read it again. Verse 11, Acts 18, verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So Paul, we've been encouraged by the Lord, been encouraged by believers. He was able to preach for a year and a half there in Corinth getting many people saved. Okay, so this church starts off really well. A few years later, we get to 1 Corinthians. A few years later, things have taken you know, a, a turn for the worse. I don't know what happened to the leadership there. I don't, I'm not sure who the bishop was for that church there, but things didn't go well. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Again, we see Sosthenes here working with Paul. Again, Paul is not a one-man show. He's always got other helpers there with him. Verse number two. Unto the church of God, which is, in Corinth, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, I had some notes here, but I'm going to move on. I'll save that probably for Thursday. Let's look at verse number three. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So Paul here is thanking the Lord for this church. This church is a bad church. This church has lost its way. But Paul says, I still give thanks to God on your behalf. Right? Maybe you're not thanking God because you're in strife, but I'm going to thank God on your behalf for your sake. You know, we see Paul there interceding in prayer for this church in Corinth. It still is a church of God, even though it's struggling in its ways. Now look at verse number uh, 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him. So the Lord enriches us. The Lord empowers us. Right? The Lord encourages us. We're enriched by the Lord. How? In all utterance and in all knowledge. Now what is utterance? If I said someone uttered something, what are we saying? It means they opened their mouth and said something, right? To utter is to speak. But one thing that you might find interesting is that, and I didn't write this down in my notes, but I believe in the Bible that word utterance appears like five, maybe six times. Not many times. But every time it's referring to preaching the gospel. Not just utterance as far as having a social conversation with someone, but utterance in the Bible is always, I encourage you to do the research, look up the word utterance when you have time at home, you'll notice that it's always referring to preaching the gospel. Let me give you one example. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 says this, 
And for me, so this is Paul saying, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. So utterance is being able to preach the gospel with boldness. So it's the Lord that enriches us, that strengthens us, that gives us the power, the ability to preach the gospel. Okay? But not just utterance. And in all knowledge. Okay? God wants us to know everything that's in this book. Everything that's in the Bible. That's a big book. 66 books. He wants us to know it all. God has given us the ability through His Holy Spirit and through teachers that He gives us and through our Bible reading and what have you to know the Bible. To know, to have His knowledge, right? We need to be Christians that are balanced in utterance and in knowledge. We can't just be Christians that have all the knowledge but never utter the gospel of Christ. Okay, you would be an unbalanced Christian. God is giving you the ability to have both of those things in your life. Okay? If you're someone that increases in knowledge, you have a lot of knowledge, but you have no utterance, you don't preach the gospel, you don't tell people about Christ, then you will be an unproductive Christian. Okay? You know a lot, but for what purpose? It's just for yourself. You know, you need to go out there and preach the gospel. You know, you need to be able to preach the gospel, maybe door to door. I know some people it's difficult, but to your family, to your friends, to your work colleagues, whenever you get the opportunity one on one with someone, preach the gospel to them. Okay? You want to be a productive Christian. God gives you the utterance, but you need to have the knowledge as well. Now, let's put it the other way around. What if you have the utterance? You have the, the zeal, yeah, I'm going to go out and preach the gospel. You know, send me out. I want to go talk. But you have no knowledge, right? You haven't studied the Word of God. You haven't prepared. You haven't memorized certain verses. You know, you haven't, you know, worked out how you will present the gospel. Then you would just look like an ignorant Christian, right? You have the utterance, you have the zeal, which is a good thing, but you don't have the knowledge. And so, before you actually go out and preach the gospel, the important thing is to prepare, to learn, to know what verses you're going to turn to. You know, be prepared to answer questions. Go as a silent partner with someone else so you can see what it's like to go soul winning, so you can see, hey, these are the kind of common questions that come to the soul winner. I need to be ready to be able to give an answer to those things. Okay? A balanced Christian will have the utterance but also have the knowledge. If you've got the knowledge but no utterance, you're unbalanced. Right? If you've got the utterance but no knowledge, you're unbalanced. You need to have both and the Lord is able to give you both of those things. Did I read verse 6? Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. T testifying of Christ, salvation. They receive that. The same way they receive salvation as that free gift, same way the Lord can provide that utterance and that knowledge. That's what he's comparing to. Look at verse number 7. So that ye become, so ye be, uh, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just cover this quickly. But what is the coming of the Lord here? Okay, I've already preached on the rapture. I've already done that. You know, we're a bit unique as a church that believes in a post-trib pre raf rapture versus the pre-trib rapture. But we see here that the coming of the Lord is the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because there are those that will tell you that the rapture is not the coming of Christ. Right? You show them passages where it talks about the coming of Christ and they're like, nope, that's not the rapture. Hold on. What is this church commanded to wait for? The coming of the Lord. The rapture. The resurrection, right? What is that? It's on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled into people saying to you that the resurrection, the rapture, is not the coming of the Lord. I'll just read a few verses to you here. Every time the Bible talks about the coming of the Lord, it's about the rapture. Every time. Let me show you a few verses here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. Don't turn there, I'll just read them out to you. For what is our, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? That's to the Thessalonian church. Chapter 3, verse 13 says this, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. With all his saints. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, 
And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Again, to the Thessalonian church, okay? This is written to the New Testament churches. I sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him when he shall appear. When does the Lord Jesus Christ appear? We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Every time. The Bible, look, the Bible's consistent. You've got a King James Bible. You don't need to be afraid that it's like God's trying to confuse you. The coming of Christ is something the church, New Testament believers ought to be watching for, ought to be waiting for. And that is the rapture. The coming of the Lord is always the rapture. Okay? Make sure that doesn't confuse you. Okay? I don't want to go into too much detail there. I already preached on the rapture not long ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That is the command for the church. That is the command for the church in Caloundra, that there would be no divisions among us. That we would be of perfectly joined together, the same mind and in the same judgment. That's the command for our church, to find unity, to be able to work together, okay? To be, you know, not divided, all right? Now, what does it mean? You say, well, how, are we, how can we, Kevin, how can we be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment? Well, first of all, what is the mind that we ought to have? Is it Kevin's mind? Is it someone else's mind? Is it some, one of your favorite preachers' mind? No, it's the mind of Christ. We ought to be Christians that are conforming ourselves, renewing our mind to have the mind of Christ in our life. But then it says of the same judgment. How do we make judgment? Well, we have the same book. We have the same Bible. We have the words of God. I don't need to make up judgments. I don't need to give you my opinion on, on making a judgment over matters. I can just take the word of God. If we hold this as our final authority, we hold this above you know, above the preacher, we hold this above man, we hold this above the opinion of man, then we will come to the same judgment because we have the same book. Right? We believe this book is perfect. We believe it's preserved. We believe it's the word of God. And he's got the right judgment. He's righteous in his judgment, right? That's how we have the same mind and the same judgment. We have the same source, Jesus Christ and his word. Okay? But here's the thing. A lot of people think this means we must see eye to eye on everything. All right? Now, I've been to many churches and I've spoken to many Christians. I've never met a Christian where I see eye to eye on everything. I mean, everything. All right? Even the, you know, the big doctrines, usually you know, the clear big doctrines, I can see eye to eye with someone. But then there are things that are not as clear that are, are more minor, that are secondary or tertiary in doctrine. And sometimes those things, you don't see eye to eye with people. I've been to churches. I've seen pastors in the same church not see eye to eye with one another. But they're able to work together and not have those divisions. Okay? My wife, we don't see eye to eye on everything, right? She's, but she's submissive and I'm, I love her and she's submissive to me. So, you know, we're not divided, right? You will never find the perfect church that believes just like you. Just accept it. And probably in the four months that I've been preaching, I've probably said things that you've been like, Kevin, yeah, I don't really agree with that. Probably, you know? That's just natural. Just learn, okay? That's just how it is. We have the flesh. None of us are perfect. We don't have perfect understanding, okay? There's no man out there that has perfect understanding. So how do we, how do we understand this then? How do we make sure there's no divisions? I'll just read to you Amos 3.3. 3. It's a pretty famous passage. Amos 3.3 3 says this. Can two walk together except they be agreed. So it's by implication, implica, implication, it's saying 
that it's, you can't walk with someone on that same path unless you're in agreement, okay? So we need to be in agreement. So what does that mean? Oh, hold on, Kevin. Didn't you just say, you know, I've never met anyone that agrees 100% the same as you? How can we put this teaching to practical use? Well, here's the thing. Obviously, there are going to be things that I differ with some other preacher, some other pastor, or some of you. Let me give you an example. I, I mentioned the rapture. We believe in a post-trib, pre raph rapture. Now, I have friends, I have pastor friends that are pre-trib believers. We get along just fine, okay? Now, if they ever put an end times conference together, do I expect to be invited to that and preach at that conference? Never, right? Because they know, well, hold on, Kevin, you believe differently to us on that doctrine. So, when we, in, that, in that path, in that end times eschatology conference, we cannot walk together because we're not in agreement. Okay, that, that's logical sense. If we ever had a post-trib conference, obviously, would I invite a pre-trib preacher to come and preach at that conference? Never, right? That, I mean, we, we can't walk together on that. But hold on, if that pre-trib uh, pastor believes the gospel as we do, salvation by grace through faith and not of works, can I go soul winning with that person? Absolutely. Why? Because in that walk, in that path, we're in agreement with one another. Okay? So just because you may differ with somebody on one doctrine that's not related to salvation or anything like that, any of the major doctrines, you say, well, in that area, we cannot walk together. But in other areas, we can walk together. We can be in agreement. Okay? Because it's a walk, it's a path. There are certain paths you just won't be able to walk with them. There are certain paths you will be able to walk with them. Don't be in the mindset that, well, hold on, you just believe differently on this one thing, therefore I can't have anything to do with you. No, obviously if they believe differently on the gospel, they preach a works-based salvation, yep, I won't have anything to do with that person whatsoever because that is the main thing, that is the foundational thing of the church. But hey, they might believe a little differently to me on something, but they believe right on the gospel, hey, let's go soul winning, right? If we have a pre-tree believer in this church, I don't want you to run them out because that person could be one of our best soul winners. Right? We can walk together with that person, see soul saves, and rejoice for eternity with that person. Right? Don't create divisions where there's no, ne no need to have divisions. So I hope that kind of clarifies to you, you know, how you can be united and yet still differ in some areas of doctrine. One thing that I will always say, and, and one day I'm going to preach on this, I've, I've said it to Jason a couple of times, if you differ with someone on the doctrine, okay, I always want you to think about this. And, and you start to get heated, and it's like, you know, uh, you know, why can't you see like I see? Don't you believe the Bible? And the other person, of course I believe the Bible. What do you, you know, that's the, by the way, that's the worst. That's the, if you want to lose an argument, that's what you say. You know, oh, I just believe the Bible. You don't believe them. Oh, they believe the Bible. They, they just have come to a different understanding than you, okay? That's a bad way to win an argument. But here's the thing. Um, always think about, okay, we differ on this issue. What is the practical implication of this? So you believe differently on this, I believe differently on that. Let, let's take the rapture, since we use that example. This friend of mine believes in the pre-trib rapture, I don't. Okay, so practically speaking, we're still going to the same rapture. <laughs> practically speaking, we can still, win, we can still preach the gospel. Uh, you know, all that's going to happen is that one of us are wrong and one of us are right. But the rapture is going to happen when the Lord says it's going to happen. And if you're saved, you're going up at the same time. I mean, is that worth fighting about then? Is that worth creating great division over? When there's no real practical difference, right? Yes, you teach one thing. Yes, certain people are going to be more prepared for difficult tribulation period to come. Where others are not, they think they're going to be taken before that. That's a difference. But that's a difference at that time. <laughs> right? That's the difference at that time. And that's where those that believe in a post-trib will have to instruct those that were pre-trib and say, well, let me explain to you why the pre-trib rapture did not occur at this time. Okay? So always think about the practical implication. Is it worth dividing over or is it not? <coughs> Look at verse 11. Now, were they, were they divided over doctrine? Actually, they, they, it wasn't doctrine that they were divided over. Look at verse 11. Division was not on doctrinal matters Division was on association. Verse 11. For it have been declared unto me, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions, so there were arguments among you. 
Now, the house of Chloe, Chloe's family, I'm assuming Chloe and her household were respected members of this church, right? Because he uses this, like, you know, this is what we've heard from, from Chloe and her house. And so that way it's not like, well, hold on, Paul, now you're mistaken, everything's fine here. No, I've heard this from a respected family in your church, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every, everyone, everyone in this church was doing this. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So some were saying, hey, I listen to Paul. That's my preacher. You know, I don't listen to the other guy. No, 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 Paul, not Paul. Apollos. I'm with Apollos. I'm with what Apollos preaches. And I was like, no, no, I'm with Cephas. Cephas is Peter. Simon Peter. And then others were like, ah, come on, you guys, I'm of Christ. You know, you guys aren't of Christ. I'm of Christ. You know, just boasting about their associations, who their favorite preacher was, right? Who they're following the steps. And that was causing them divisions because they had different favorite preachers and they wouldn't want to associate with those that had different other favorite preachers. It's like, well, you've got to be in my circle. You've got to be in my group. And you've got to be just like me. Otherwise, I'm going to have contentions and divisions among you. It wasn't even on doctrine. It was on who they idolized in their mind as preachers. Who's Apollos? Do you guys know who Apollos is? I should have told you to say it in the book of Acts. But Acts 18. Keep a finger there in 1 Corinthians. Let's look at this very quickly. Acts 18, verse 24. We, we were reading from Acts 18. So if you're still there, that's good. Acts 18, verse 24. <coughs> so this is, remember, Acts 18 is when Paul went to Corinth and started the church. But further, later on, it says here in verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man. What's, what's it mean to be eloquent? A good speaker. You know, he was really good with his words. You know, he's able to uh, 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 convince people with his words. And he's a good preacher. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, so he, he had good knowledge in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. But this is where his weakness was, knowing only the baptism of John. So I'm assuming this guy learnt from John the Baptist, but that's all he knew. He, maybe he took off before Christ came on the scene, he didn't have the full revelation that Christ had delivered to the apostles, to the disciples, and to what, you know, the Holy Spirit were moving the apostles to preach and to teach in all these churches. He knew what John had taught him, knowing only the baptism of John. Then he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So he does the same thing as Paul. He goes to the synagogue. Well, actually, no, this is a different town. This is Ephesus. But still, it, uh, boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, here they are again, this couple, had heard... They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So Quill and Priscilla see the, the great you know, benefit this guy is. Now, was he a little bit off? Yes, he was a little bit off. Did they run him off and say, hey, you're a false prophet, you don't know anything? No, they were loving. They took him in and said, hey, let us expound to you a little bit more. There's been more. Christ has come. You know, the apostles, have, the churches have started. Let's teach you a little bit more so when you preach, you can have you know, a, a greater uh, uh, knowledge. You can uh, expound more of the Word of God. And Aquila and Priscilla took this upon themselves. Look at this. I mean, this, this is a great couple encouraging other believers. Verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them with much, uh, much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So this guy was actually a little bit better than Paul in convincing the Jews. Paul was struggling to convince the Jews. That's why he said, I'm done with you. I'm going on to the Gentiles. But Apollos, I guess he was, because of his more eloquent speech and his mighty way of preaching, was able to convince the Jews, showing that Jesus was Christ. And it came to pass. Now this is a bit that I just want to show you. Verse, uh, sorry, chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. So we see that uh, Apollos also came to the Corinthians, right? He came to them, taught in their churches. Now, just to show, just to show you who Apollos was, okay? Because we don't really know much about him. We know who Paul was. We know who Simon Peter is. We don't necessarily know so much about Apollos. So go back to 1 Corinthians. But I just want to show you that these men 
that the Corinthian church were idolizing weren't false prophets. They weren't bad teachers. They were all good men of God, right? Peter, Paul, the apostles, and Apollos, this great preacher, this eloquent speaker, this man who was able to convince many Jews about Christ. These were good men that they were listening to. These were good men that they were following. But they got to the point where they idolized them too much and it caused division in this church. Too much. You know, I encourage you to have your favorite preachers. I encourage you to listen to preaching from other men of God. But don't hold them so highly that if, oh, well, if you don't listen to that person, then oh, I can't have anything to do with you. That is carnal. I'll just read to you. You can turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Just a couple of pages over. Verse 1. This is childish behavior. Guys, this is childish behavior. Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. So Paul says, look, I can't even talk to you about spiritual matters. You're carnal. You're the flesh. You're, you're walking after the flesh. Even as unto babes in Christ. Your babies. I've been preaching there for a year and a half. Apollos has come. Peter has come. You've had a great start, but you're still babes. You're still babies. Why? I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither now, uh, yet now are ye able. So you can't even take on the deep things of God. You, we've got to just go back to teaching you milk, is what Paul is saying to this church. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? If you're someone that only wants to associate with people because of that, that group mentality, or this one preacher, or this one, whatever it is, I don't want to associate with you. You are carnal. You are a baby, if that's the way you are. All right? Now, I don't know. I'm not saying anyone here is. I'm just, I don't want us to be this way. Right? I don't want us to be this way. I'm not saying any of you guys are. I'm not, if, if, I, if you were, I'd tell you privately. I'm just preaching the Word of God. We come to Corinthians. This was a problem. That means it can become a problem in our church if we allow it to be that. Okay? This reminds me of high school or primary school. Right? I, I remember, you know, I, I like to get along with as many people as I possibly can. Right? And I, I, I remember, I'm just thinking about an incident back in high school, uh, primary school, where I had friends, um, and, uh, like, you know, everyone, like, we had this big group of friends, and then one person had a fight with one other person, and then that group of friends split, right? And I'm like, but I'm friends with this, and I'm friends with that. And what I did when that happened, I just found another group of friends, because I didn't want to choose one over another. And then when I went to, you know, I went to play soccer with another group of friends, and then this group said to me, Kevin, why aren't you with us, you know? Uh, and I'm like, you know, why are you still with them? I said, well, I wasn't with them. I was with this other group. And then this group came up to me, Kevin, why aren't you with us? Why? That is childish behavior, okay? Just because there's association, just because, you know, well, you're friends with that person, therefore I can't be friends with you here, that is childish. That's what children do. That's high school, that's school. That's ridiculous. You're adults. You should be spiritual now. Grow up in Christ. Hear the word of God. Mature. Don't be babes like this Corinthian church was. That's what they were. They were children, they were babies, and they were carnal. But they were following good men. Do you see that? It's not like they were following false prophets. They were following good men, but they still fell into this trap of worshipping men. And I'm going to show to you that they were indeed, in a way, worshipping men. They were lifting them and instead of lifting up Christ. And you know what this tells me? If, if a group could say, well, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of C, you know what that tells me? That tells me that Apollos, Paul, and Peter were different type of preachers. There was something different about each one of them. Okay? God, we're all different. We're all different. And if you're called to preach, God's going to use your mannerisms, God's going to use your personality, God's going to use your experiences and knowledge to preach the Word of God. God wants to use you the way you are. Okay? God is the one that works in you you don't need to feel like you need to mimic another preacher to be worth, you know, something. No, you are who you are. Allow God to uh, 
mature you, allow to God to help you grow and to preach His Word. Okay? I don't want to be... You know, I've had Jason and Callum preach behind the pulpit. I don't want to be like Jason. I don't want to be like Callum. And I don't want Callum and Jason to think they need to be like me. I want them to be themselves. I want them to be used by God. Because if it's all like... If everyone's like me, what's, just have the one preach then. Right? What's the point? If everyone's exactly the same, there's no need for having other men. Right? We need to work toward being like Jesus Christ, not like some great man of God. Great men of God can be great examples to us, but your eyes should always be on Christ. Because I'll tell you why, men of God will fail you. And I'll tell you now, I will fail you. I'm going to say something to offend you. I don't know. I'm going to do something that... You know, Kevin's actually not that great after all. Look, if that, when that happens, it's going to happen. And when that happens, you go, well, I'm looking to Christ anyway. Right? I know Kevin's a man. I'll pray for him. That's what I want you to do. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> I'm not even halfway, guys. All right. <laughs> I'll save it for some other time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. Is Christ divided? So, hold on. Remember that these guys were creating division in the church. They were following men. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, and beside, besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Who was crucified for you? Was it Paul? It was Jesus Christ, right? It was Jesus Christ. Whose name were you baptized in? It was, you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus Christ. Make sure you remember that because this is what's going to happen. When you idolize men too greatly, Paul has to say to you, you know, let's say you idolize me. Was Kevin crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Kevin? What's he, what's he saying? You've replaced Christ with this man. That's how you, what you should be viewing Christ as the one who was crucified, the one, the name of who you were baptized under. You now, in your mind, have put that man in replace of Christ. When you start causing divisions about who your favorite preachers are, right? <clears throat> I'm going to try to hurry up here, but uh, I guess I'll. Verse 17: For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Um, I had a few things here, but look, I'll just repeat what it says here. Is baptism the gospel? Is baptism part of the gospel? What's the gospel? The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Faith on Christ. Faith on His death, burial, and resurrection. Is water baptism part of the gospel? Not according to verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Just reaffirming those that say, well, you need to be baptized to be saved. No, <laughs> it's not part of the gospel. It's been conf that's what, this is one of the best passages to turn to, to show to people that baptism, water baptism, is not a requirement for salvation. It is something that's done after salvation as a testimony that you have put your faith on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Verse 19. Oh, wait, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? Unto salvation, the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise, and where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, is this saying that preaching the gospel is foolish? Is that what it's saying here? No, it's foolish to those who believe they're wise, to those that believe they can do without God, who can do without Christ, who can do without His salvation, who believe by their works they can be saved, who believe by their religion and their baptisms and their traditions can be saved. They think they're wise. And that's the gospel that we preach to them is foolishness. How many times have you preached the gospel? And it's like, is that all? I mean, what, just believe? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's almost foolish until it clicks in their mind. It, it is just belief, right? It's like foolishness to them. <clears throat> we go and knock doors. They believe we're foolish. That's how the world sees us and sees the gospel. But that's not foolishness. It's not foolishness to us. It is, our power, it is the power of God. <clears throat> I think I'm up to verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And I had a few notes here, but I'm going I'm to fast forward. But basically, the Jews want a miracle. They want to see... It. You know how people say, well, I'll believe it when I see God with my own eyes. That's essentially what the Jews want. And here's the funny thing. They did see God with their own eyes. <laughs> they had Jesus Christ come, God manifest in the flesh before them. They still didn't believe, right? And what do the Greeks want? They want the wisdom. They want, hey, they don't want the Bible. They want the wisdom of man because they think the Bible and the gospel is foolishness. Are they going to get their sign? Are they going to get their uh, wisdom? No, they're going to get the foolishness. Look at verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. That's what they get. They get a stumbling block and they get foolishness instead, instead of what they're seeking, right? Because that's what Christ is to the world. <clears throat> but what's the sign? I'll just read to you very quickly. What's the sign to the Jews? The Jews, you know, because you hear this a lot. You hear, well, the Jews are waiting for this sign and then they'll believe. You know, this future sign in the end times, whatever it is, that's when they'll believe on Christ. No. Matthew 12, 40, Jesus says this, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Oh, sorry, I didn't read verse... I should read... I'll, I'll go back and read verse 39. Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. So those that are seeking after some miracle, some sign, what does God call them? A wicked and adulterous... An evil and adulterous generation. They seek after a sign. But there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And that's where he says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the, whale of the, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign that these people, the evil and wicked, uh, adulterous generation, are going to get is the sign that we come. When we knock on the door, we tell them Christ died for you, He was buried three days and three nights, rose again from the grave. That's their sign. All right? They can't say, Well, God, you didn't show me. You didn't give me a miracle. He'll be like, I sent that prophet unto you and you rejected him. They came preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the sign for salvation. <clears throat> Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So is, is this saying God is foolish? Is it saying that God is weak? No, but it's, it's saying if God were foolish... If God were weak, it's still stronger than man. It's still wiser than what man can do. You know, the gospel is foolish and weak from the perspective of the naysayers, yet it is wiser and stronger than all men. You come with a message that's wise. You come with a message that has power and strength. When you go and preach the gospel, go boldly. Don't be timid. You've got the wisdom. You've got the power and the strength from the Lord, okay? The utterance and the knowledge that God gives you. That's how you ought to go. You're an ambassador for the Lord. You're an ambassador of God. You should be going out, telling people with boldness, with courage as an ambassador of, of heaven. Verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, and not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things, what's base? Just the basic, simple things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. You might say to me, Kevin, you know what? Verse 27, I, I'm, I'm the weak. I, I'm weak, like verse 27. I'm, I'm a weak person. Or like verse 28, I'm, I'm basic, I'm, I'm a simple, I don't have great knowledge, I'm, I'm a simple person, I'm, I'm weak. Verse 28, despised, I'm despised by my family, by my friends, I'm, I'm weak, simple, despised. If that's you, yeah, that's the one God wants to use. <laughs> if that's you, God wants to use you to preach boldly the mystery of the gospel, okay? To bring forth the power of salvation 
to this lost and dying world. God wants to use you. He's not after the mighty. He's not after the noble. He's not after the great man that the world lifts up. He's after you. He's after you in your weaknesses. Okay, God will use you. God will use your strengths and God will help you through your weaknesses. God wants to use you. Never think that God will use... You know, I don't know what you guys think of my preaching, if you think it's good, but let me say, I wasn't anywhere near this good a few years ago, right? I mean, you've got to start somewhere. You know, you might start weak, but, you know, God will use you. God will work in you and use you, you know, even in your weaknesses. You know, I sometimes stumble in the words I say. I can't pronounce words sometimes, but I just push through anyway. <laughs> God decided to use me. He's going to have to put up with my weaknesses and help me along that path. Why? Why does he want to use the weak? Why does he want to use the despised and the simple and the basic? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Right? God doesn't like pride. God doesn't like people that think they're so great because he wants to be glorified. We come to church not to glorify the preacher. We come to church not to glorify man. We come to church to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Look, God's given us the wisdom. He's given us righteousness, that imputed righteousness of Christ. He's sanctified us, sanctification that's been set apart, been holy for the Lord's work. God wants to use us for his work and redemption. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, by his sacrifice, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, should we glory? Yes. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in God. That's what you ought to glory in. Don't glory in yourself. Don't glory in your preacher. Don't glory in man. Don't glory in your favorite preachers and cause divisions. What's going to keep us united as a church is glorifying Christ, making sure our eyes are set upon him. We use great men of God as our example. We learn great truths from great men of God, but our eyes must always be set on Jesus Christ. If we glory in Christ and not in man, this church will never be divided. Okay, let's pray.